Joel. That's the sound I want to hear. <laughs> it's on my glasses. Oh, I know it's on. Hey, welcome to Getting to Know Jesus. Where's my thing? Here we are. Here's my thing. We are in Lesson 91 One. on pages 129 to 139 in your book. And the Bible text is on pages 130 and 131. And the lesson notes are on pages 132 to 137. And you can write your notes in there. If you can write fast enough. Some of you are going to have to take shorthand, huh? Oh, nobody uses that anymore. Does anybody know what shorthand I is? Know. Yes, I do. I was forced what? to take it in high I school. Took I took it. I did three too, years. but I couldn't read my writing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you couldn't read the notes back. No. no. I couldn't read the notes back. Well, that makes it kind of fun. I love shorthand. But okay, well, we're going to talk about Jesus warns the Pharisees. Oh, I, I, I like it when the bad guys get what they have coming to them. Of course... That's accepted. Wait, well, I, I should say, I like it when the other bad guys get what's coming to them. I don't like it when they get what's coming to me. And I don't like, I, I, I want to be good, so sometimes I am. We're going to talk about priorities tonight. And here's our little talk time. We're right down here at the, getting towards the end of Jesus' ministry. And uh, so we're going to talk about priorities. So, question. Do you know but you're going to die. Hopefully soon. Uh, <laughs> Morty, don't, don't rush. Well, I have special yeah. revelation for God. Yes, Richard? Uh, we had a person I worked with was into Ouija boards and spiritism. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Not and good. Uh, she asked me, she, she talked to Ouija board about me and brought me back a page and a half discussion where the demons were discussing me oh, with her, no. which is kind of scary. Yeah. And uh, she says, don't you believe this? I says, I don't want to know when I'm going to die because it may become a self-fulfilled prophecy. Uh -huh. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things you don't want to know. But the, of course, those that are into spiritism, it's uh, dangerous. They're playing with something dangerous. It might end up being a self It's not a game you really want to play. Although I do remember some kids that I played with back in uh, Osage City, Kansas. They said that one night their grandfather said goodbye. And the next morning he was gone. So, but that was, you know, maybe just a few hours, not like days or whatever. You know, unless the doctor is giving you a diagnosis of terminal illness, you do not have a clue. And even if the doctor has said, you've got a terminal illness, he could be off by days, weeks, or even months. Four years. Four years. We are all going to die. Unless Jesus comes first. So the real question is, do you have your priorities in order? We're in Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 21. Jesus continues and builds on his criticism of the Pharisees. Now, we kind of started into that last week. He said, woe to you Pharisees. He said it three times. He gave them a three. And then the scribes said, well, well you're hurt. I'm feeling too. And Jesus pronounced three woes on them. Christy? Who's Nicodemus and Joseph? He's a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were two Pharisees who happened to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Yeah. We're going to have to touch on that. And just uh, Actually, uh, there are a couple exceptions. See, the, the, Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees as a group. But we have to realize a lot of times when we lay out these blanket criticisms, although they may be generally accurate, they're not necessarily always specifically accurate. And Nicodemus and, and uh, 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 Joseph of Arimathea were exceptions to the rule. They were Pharisees, but they still believed that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the big one. The rest of the Pharisees, or most of the rest of the Pharisees, did not. So most of the Pharisees are guilty as charged, they need to change their ways. Are you guilty of any of these behaviors that the Pharisees were guilty of? Uh, are you a Pharisee? Ooh. I hope not. Yeah, I, hope not I wrote a blog, and if you go to my website and look for it, it's there. I'm glad I'm not a Pharisee. <laughs> and I talked about what they were and why I don't want to be what they were. So, But you know what? There are a lot of people who are just like the Pharisees today. They have so many little rigid rules and regulations on top of what God requires of us. And they say, if you don't do this, you're not religious. You're not saved. You're not holy enough or something. 
Well, we've got a battle to fight where we to deal with our priorities. <clears throat> Number one, hypocrites will be exposed. Luke chapter 12, 1 to 3. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or nothing hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Because even though people around you might not hear it, God is. Ooh. Interesting when people come out with a string of words that uh, are not appropriate to repeat in church. And they say, oh, there's the preacher there. Oh, I'm sorry, preacher. As though I am the one that's going to judge them for saying those kinds of words. God hears them when I'm nowhere around. I was listening to... Uh, talking to some guys and they had a radio station on and I heard a couple of words on the radio and I said, you guys listen to that? Next thing I knew, I didn't hear the radio anymore. They turned it down. <clears throat> Until they drove off. <laughs> Sad. Jesus begins his comments with a warning against the yeast, the influence or the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, <clears throat> the yeast is what makes the bread rise. Any of you that do baking, or you know anything about how bread is made or anything that uh, has leaven in it, that's the yeast that uh, helps to make it rise. It's what makes it work. And it influences its surroundings. Now, I want to be yeast for Jesus Christ, not yeast for the devil. So, but the Pharisees, they meant well, but they were so uh, wrapped up in their little rules and regulations that they were overtaxing and overbearing and it was not fair to anyone else. <clears throat> they think that they're religious and holy, but they are good at, they're really good at not practicing what they preach. Their hypocrisy will be exposed. Now God knows and will expose our behavior. So the question for us is, are you living like a Christian, or are you pretending to be a Christian on Sundays, and but hiding it Sunday afternoon through the following Saturday night? Where were you Saturday night before you went to church? Like the one lady I told you about before that Sylvia worked with, claimed she was a Christian, but she'd come in Monday morning bragging about how drunk she got, and how many guys she was, uh, uh, what she was doing Saturday night. And then she goes to church, the Proverbs said that the adulteress wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Some of us don't realize, if we aren't examining ourselves and looking at what we're doing, we don't realize that we might be doing something that is against God and hurtful to God and to His church. It's like the meeting this past week that I spoke at. Or I, I did. I, I just a city council meeting. I stood up and made a comment, and uh, I just said the problem, the root problem, is that the people that are serving have gotten more wrapped up in serving themselves than they have in the people they're supposed to serve. And it's all about me. No, it's not about me. It's about serving God and serving others. So God knows your behavior. It will be exposed. You may fool some of the people. But God knows and others are going to find out. Most generally, if you're doing something that is not of God, if you're doing something that is unrighteous, sooner or later, you're going to mess up and it's going to be exposed to those who are in your circle that pay attention to those things that you do. It may even make the newspaper or the television station. And that would not be the kind of exposure you want. We don't want to be recognized for the bad things we do like a wiener in New York or uh, uh, a few others we might pick on. We want to be exposed and known for the good that we do. Hopefully. See, whatever you do for God will be exposed. So you can do bad things, that's going to be found out. Or you can do good things 
and people are going to notice. Yeah, you don't talk like you used to. You don't talk like the rest of us. Why? Well, I realize that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I don't want to use the kind of words that hurt him anymore. So I don't use his name as a byword anymore. I don't use God along with that damn thing that we stop up rivers with anymore. I don't use Christ as a byword anymore. I want to honor God with my tongue and with my mouth and with my heart. And so I don't do those things that I have done in the past. Well, we also want to fear God more than men. I tell you, my friends, Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. <clears throat> Jesus warns and advises that no man is as serious of a threat to us as God. Now, I read, I get emails every week. Uh, I get stuff in the mail from uh, Christian martyrs, or Voice of the Martyrs, I mean, and other places. And, and I'm constantly hearing and reading about it. And some of the ministries that I've sent getting to know Jesus to in Pakistan, and India, and Uganda, and uh, uh, Africa, other places in Africa, will write back and tell me of persecution that is going on. <clears throat> ministers that are in jail because they're proclaiming Jesus Christ. But you know, it's, it's just like, uh, oh, and I get some of my devotions now that I, I read uh, uh, this date in history. And they talk about somebody that was born on this date. And some of those people, the things that they went through, but they would not deny Christ. The man knew he was going to be killed. And yet, he continued to proclaim Christ all the way up to the moment. And they tortured him. They didn't just slice and you're done. They made it hurt that he would not deny Christ. If you get uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you can have some, read some stories in there that will probably upset your stomach mm -hmm. and make you sick of things that Christians endured because they would they knew you can you, you it's easy for me to say it right now because it's not happening. <clears throat> but you can torture my body. You can do anything you want with me. You can even kill me. But you can't take my soul. You can't do a thing to my soul. <clears throat> it belongs to Jesus. And that is a determination we need to have in our minds. Because God can not only kill your body. He can throw your soul into hell. And if you were here just a few weeks ago and I preached on what the Bible says about hell, that's not a place you want to go. And it's not a place to joke about either. People that are going there are going to be very sorry that they made a, a joke out of it. Now God can save you from your sins or throw you into eternal hell. It's your choice. There are those today that want, us to, want to stop you from living a Christian life. Some want you to convert to their pagan or anti-God religion. Some will simply persecute you through words and intimidation. However, there are others who will seek to kill you if they can find a way to get away with it. Remember, they can kill your body, but they cannot kill your soul. Only God can do that. And I just pray right now, I, I just really want to camp on this, and we've got to go on, but I pray that you'll take some time to think about these words, and that you'll make that determination in your life. I don't care what they do to me at work. I don't care what they do to me where I live. I don't care if the government does tell me that I can't speak out against homosexuality or sexual immorality or, or lying and cheating and government corruption. They can do anything they want to stop me. But they cannot take me away from Jesus Christ. Amen. And I stand for Him. Well, let's see. God is keeping score. Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. <coughs> Excuse me. You really didn't have to hear that on camera. He says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many 
sparrows. So, Jesus reminds the apostles that God knows and cares about the sparrows that we take so for granted. Yeah, I like watching the birds come to the bird feeder, but they come to the bird feeder and then they go on and do the thing. And there's some of the birds that I see in our yard that don't come to our bird feeder. I don't know why. <laughs> but God cares about them. They somehow find food to eat somewhere. They're still alive. They still fly around in the neighborhood. God cares more about you than about those birds. You may sometimes feel that you're all alone and that no one cares about what is happening to you. But God knows and cares and He is keeping score. So the question is, are you living in such a way that He can bless you? Are you living your life in a way that other people will see and say, wow, you must be a Christian. Isn't it wonderful? I hope that every one of you, at least one time or another, has had somebody come up to you, somebody, a co-worker, or, or maybe somebody that you don't even know, and they've said, you're a Christian, aren't you? <clears throat> Isn't it wonderful when your life is that powerful of an influence on others? <clears throat> Another thing we want to do is confess Jesus as your Lord. Luke 12, verses 8 and 9. I tell you, Jesus is still speaking, whoever acknowledges me before men, I, the Son of Man, will acknowledge him before the angels of God. But who, uh, uh, he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. Now, he's going to repeat this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, a little bit later on. And some would say, well, that's all the same event. No, you know, a lot of preachers have a good sermon. They preach it here, they preach it here, they'll preach it over there. Especially if there are these uh, uh, these guys that we've listened to going around the country telling us that our country's in trouble. <coughs> Their message is basically the same. But those folks haven't heard it yet. And so they go and tell them. And then these folks haven't heard it yet. And they go and tell them. Christy? For example, remember when John the Baptist, he was baptizing? Was he, like, giving people Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit until uh, Jesus came? The Holy Spirit came upon him. Is that similarity? John the Baptist did not give people the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, he I mean, just taught them to repent of their sins, and they repented of their sins and stopped a lot of their sinful behavior. Repenting means that you stop doing it. A lot of people think of repenting of their sins, saying, "Oh, I sinned <laughs> again," and they keep on doing it. Well, we but real repentance means to turn around. It means I'm not going to do that anymore. That was what John's message was about. Jesus will give us the Holy Spirit actually on the day of Pentecost. The apostles will get it and it goes out from there. Morty? I'm just going to comment on what you just said. You have to remember what it's for. It's for repentance. Turning about and going in the opposite direction. And it's a getting, a, a getting ready is what it's for because you have to remember what John came for. The porter that opens the door for Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb yeah. of God that takes away the sin of the world. Not me, but the Lamb of God. I'm he was the one opening the door, making ready for Christ. Sin of uh, uh, baptizing under repentance is just getting us ready. If you remember the baby's birth the other day, and the town crier went out and made a royal announcement that this royal person had been born and all. Well, John the Baptist was the royal announcer, the town crier that went out to tell the world the Messiah is here and you better get ready. And that's what his job was. Okay, we're talking about confessing Jesus as your Lord. Jesus declares that salvation is based on simply confessing Him as our Lord and Savior. To deny Jesus is to die in your sin. To confess Him, well, thank you. There you go. To confess Him is eternal life. It really can't be much simpler than this. We don't have to perform a bunch of miracles. Uh, we don't have to perform a bunch of rituals or believe a bunch of denominational man-made doctrines. Now, I don't want to be too harsh on those man-made doctrines. They're all good intention. But sometimes we get a little too camped out on our pet doctrines and we lose sight of what the Bible tells us. We're not saved by man-made doctrines. We're saved by what Jesus did on the cross and our faith in Him. <clears throat> Anything else that God expects of us 
The process of being saved, the process of living a Christian life is first tied around who Jesus is. If Jesus says it, that settles it. All else is man-made and not relevant to eternal life. And so our church has this way of worshiping. That church over there has that way of worshiping. We sometimes think we want to poke fun at them, but we better not. They're just doing it the way God has led them to do it, and they believe that Jesus is Lord just like we do. And that makes us family. Morty? This word confessed is highly misused a lot. If you look at it in, its, in what it's supposed to be, it, it refers to witness more than anything else. Yes. And if you take the word confess, and we've, we've, we've made it part of the plan of salvation, but I contend that the word confess means to witness before men. Yes. I look at upon it as an evangelistic type thing or letting your life so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. That kind of confession. As far as it being part of the plan of salvation, why isn't it in the second chapter of the book of Acts? Well, they did there. Mm -hmm. and why, why is it in repent and be baptized? Such as yeah. And, but you're right. It, it's more than just coming down to the front of the church amongst people who believe in Jesus and saying, okay, I confess Jesus is my Lord. It means living it out there so the people out there will see that Jesus is your Lord. And when they come to you and tempt you to do something that's unchristian, you'll say, no, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and I don't want to do that because that would hurt Jesus. And He loves me too much for me to do something so cruel to hurt Him. Well, let's talk about one more thing. Here's another big one. I thought that was a... I, I wish I had time to just take a, each one of these sections tonight and just spend a whole lesson on it because there's just so much meat in here. But this is powerful too. And I've been waiting for a while to get to this. Have, have you, well, well, I'll get that question in a minute. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Luke 12, 10 through 12. And Jesus says, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you were brought before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. In contrast, Jesus warns that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. Now I've got a question here. How many of you at one time or another just kind of wondered, I wonder if I ever blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Have you kind of... I wondered. I wondered, I wondered a little bit, yeah. I say, oh, have I done something to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What does blaspheme mean? Speak evil of. Uh, yeah, speak evil of. That's, that's a, a really a good answer. Here's one that says curse God. We're, we're going to define... I'm going to try to clarify that just a little bit. Isn't, isn't it just not just believing? Not, Do what? Is it no, not believing? No, it's like... It, it's unbelief uh, to an extreme almost. Well, it's just it's to speak out against. Yeah, and unbelief to the point of speaking out against. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that there are probably going to be some people who said, well, I spoke out against Jesus one time, many, many long time ago. Does that mean I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you an answer to that. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Jesus warns that the blaspheme, the uh -huh, Holy Spirit is unforgivable. Any other sin. Adultery, lying, stealing, even murder can be forgiven if you will confess and say, I was wrong and I'm sorry and I'll never do that again. It can be forgiven. But to die, to deny the Holy Spirit's testimony that Jesus is Lord cannot be forgiven. Now the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Jesus. It's not about the Holy Spirit but about Jesus, no matter what you have done in the past, adultery, stealing, lying, assault, uh, sexual immorality, murder, you can be forgiven if you confess Jesus of your, as your Lord and repent. Never do it again. If you never accept Christ, you'll never be good enough to see even the pearly gates of heaven. So yes, all of us have those things and it hurts me. When my mind brings to me, ooh, I did that. And I have to remind myself it's under the blood because I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And as long as you have breath in your body, 
And this is why I know there have been times, Richard, maybe you've had a funeral like this for somebody, and it's kind of like, you don't know if that person was a Christian or not, you know. Compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> <laughs> no. I've had a funeral or two, a couple of funerals especially, that it was really hard <clears throat> to say that person was in heaven. Because I did not know. They weren't walking it. They weren't talking it. They had no evidence. I don't know if they denied. The only reason they got to do their funeral is because their mother used to be a member of our church many years before. Mm -hmm. And she was living somewhere else up in Montana. And they were there in California where I was. And she asked, will you do their funeral? Oh, that was tough. Richard? Yeah, Stuart Fitzgerald's co-preacher there in Point Pennsylvania was preaching out of Pittsburgh. And the toughest funeral he had is it was a third suicide in the family. Uh, the, the kid kid committed suicide, the old man committed suicide, the, oh other, the uncles committed suicide. He was asked to do the funeral, and he did. Mm -hmm. He uses his text, Saul, King Saul, who mm -hmm. who uh, was the one that fell on his sword. Fell on his fell sword. On his sword. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he says mm -hmm. he, he gave you the shirt off his back to do anything for you, but always had to do it his way. And he based his whole sermon like, who was that singer that said, I did it my way? Uh -huh. And that's what yeah. how his sermon was based on. He always had to do it my way. Mm -hmm. Even killing himself, he had to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And after he got done with that sermon, a lot of the family comes and says, Brother Fitzgerald, we didn't like your sermon very much. But he figured he needed to shock them because here's got the whole family and here's suicide number three mm -hmm. in that family. Oh, so one of your wake up all the time. That was yeah, a yeah. tough sermon for him to preach. Oh, but that. it was not Imagine. popular with the people in the family. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's go on a little further because there are a few more points that Jesus hits on before we get done here. Here is a picture of the Judean hillside. Um, I see that uh, probably a church building there. So maybe just on the outside of Jerusalem. I'm not sure. Uh, Jim brought that one to us too. A lot of his pictures in here. Well, there's one more thing, and that is don't be greedy. Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 15. Is Jesus covering the gamut or is he just covering the gamut? Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you two? And then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For a man's life does not consist in abundance of his possessions. Jesus, almost like he's wanting to change the subject, somebody in the crowd asked Jesus, to make his brother share his inheritance with him. He thinks that Jesus could judge between him and his brother. <laughs> Jesus tells him that money won't give life. Possessions are meaningless when it comes to being right before God. Now we often focus on my share instead of caring about others. What was this problem that we had in our police department with police officers? Uh, a few police officers <coughs> doing things immoral and breaking the laws that they were sworn to uphold and then covering for one another and hiding the internal affairs investigation so it never came to light until, whoops, it came to light and now a whole bunch of police officers are dismissed. The whole department is, is embarrassed and ashamed and having to do damage control and restore their integrity. And I said, the problem is we got selfish. We got our focus off of our uh, police officers sworn to serve the community. We're here to serve. Well, I don't think they were, those were serving the community very well when they were serving their own sin. Greed is selfish. And selfish is sin. And what's in the middle of sin? I. I? <laughs> I guess I've said enough about that. You can't gain eternal life by being selfish. Now I'm going to have to go back and qualify that statement just just a minute, but Richard wants to say something first. Uh, for the congregation's information, Glenn was on uh, channel Tampa Bay News, Bright House News uh, this week. Roy, our neighbor, called me up and says, Glenn's on TV. <laughs> and he was making comment about the selfishness that, and the, the pride that interfered with the uh, police power corrupting and uh, so on. So Glenn talk. had his Roy that thought he was on for five minutes. Glenn said he was only on for two minutes. But. I watched the clock that was timing me and it I still know. had two to three minutes left on it yeah, when I said thank you. you were so, anyway, so Glenn had his, had his, had his 
Moment of glory. glory. Okay, Christy? <laughs> what? Really See, we are born with sin. Since Adam. So we're going to, we since all the time. But as long as we look up to Jesus and have him forgive us, we should be all right. Let me rephrase that a little bit. We were born selfish. Right. Selfish. We weren't born sin. We were born in a world where sin is. But we don't become sin until we can become old enough to realize that I did wrong and I did it anyhow. That's the age of accountability. That's when we become sinners. Now, there's a good side to our selfish nature. Hopefully, you're here because you're selfish that you want eternal life and you want to live for God. But when you're selfish comes at the expense of others and, and you try to power or control or do things that hurt God and hurt Jesus, that's bad selfishness. So there is a pride, eyes in the middle of pride also. There is a degree where pride is good if it's used in a godly way. But and selfish can be good in a godly way. I, I, I eat dinner tonight because I figure out that it's in, in the best interest of my long-term health to nourish my physical body. And you like it. And, and, we're, and I like it. And we're now nourishing our spiritual bodies with God's Word. So we're building uh, in a, a healthy selfish. But if I were to say, okay, you guys got to pay me more money, uh, you'd probably all leave and go somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, that'd be selfish. That would be selfish with a big eye. Okay, I saw a hand up. A minute. Yeah. More morning. I don't think we're born selfish. I think we develop selfishness mm -hmm. as we grow. Because we're born with a blank, I think, with a blank tape, so to speak. I mean, if I said to my son, who was uh, a year old, say, Hi, sinner. Ha, ha, ha. Guy, guy, guy. Good, good. That would have been. You know, that's the selfish. We, we're, we're, our selfish is not a problem selfishness until we reach the age where we realize we're doing right and we're doing wrong. Until then, it's just self-preservation, which is normal and healthy. A baby cries because he's hungry. That's being selfish. But it's a good selfish. Wanda? I've always worried about the accountability. I think there's all ages of you have to just put that one in the hands of God and figure out that He knows. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, George had his hand up first. Yeah, that, that first one up there, someone asked Jesus to make his brother share his inheritance. That's like, you know, two brothers are always saying, you know, I get my, I get my half. You know, they're always wanting their half. So it's many like, times, and this doesn't always have to happen. In fact, fortunately, it doesn't always happen. But I've heard way too many times, mom and dad die, and here's their inheritance, and the kids, yeah. instead of saying, thank you, God, for letting mom and dad give us a little inheritance, they get to squabbling, I want more, I want more, I want more, and then yeah. they end up fighting over each other, and families get busted up over it. Did you want to say something, Christy? Okay, if someone uses me uh, for their selfish needs, is that a sin? If somebody uses you to what? They uses me. And I was hoping them, and they used me for their selfish needs. Is that, is that a sin? Not for you, but for them. Yeah. Unless that selfish need is something, you know, like, uh, can you help me get to the doctor? Then they, they need to get to the doctor. But if they're taking advantage of you, yes. fix my computer, but I'm not going to pay you, then that's sin. Because yes. you do it for a living. You need to get paid. Right. Uh, we... we, we uh, the sooner we realize that this life is about loving God and serving others, the sooner we will get the priorities in God's order. It's not about the stuff. So let's talk about the real value of possessions. Luke 12, 16 to 21. And he told them this parable. A ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, you fool. Notice how God always speaks in such a deep, masculine, basic voice. Now. You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, 
but is not rich towards God. See, Jesus reinforces the comments against greed by a parable of a rich man who thinks he's going to live forever. How many of us like to think we're going to live forever? <laughs> well, kind of. You we know, don't with, want to. I, I don't think that tomorrow I'm going to die. I don't think I'm going to have a car accident on the way home tonight and be standing facing Jesus before I can get, get over to my residence. I think I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and go through another day tomorrow trying to get more churches to do getting to know Jesus and, and I'm going to go about doing the things that I normally do, the part of our, and, and on and on. And don't we all kind of think that? Tomorrow's going to be just another day. And like Richard said, it's a good thing we don't know which tomorrow is not going to be just another day because some of us would do a little something self-fulfilling, very possible. See, even though he has an abundant harvest, he is about to die. And all that wealth will be of no value to him, but will go to someone else. Instead, he should share the wealth, not by the government taking it and saying, we're going to determine how it's shared, but by him saying, you know, I, I care about you, can I help you out? And him sharing. That's the kind of sharing the Bible teaches. That's a little sidebar there, but Jesus never advocated socialism. He advocates giving. And when the government takes from you, that's not giving. You've heard the statement that says, He who has the most toys win. However, Please. the truth is that he who has the most toys leaves them behind <laughs> when he dies. And all of the toys or money in the world cannot buy you one second in heaven with God. So the conclusion is this. We must consider our priorities and make sure Jesus is first. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I hope that this is in your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Nothing is more valuable than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And I believe you wouldn't be here if that wasn't true. That's right. Next week, Jesus will tell us how to avoid anxiety attacks. Anybody oh. had any of those in the last... <laughs> I think I had one. That'll help me too. I think I had one at the city council meeting the other night. I was going to get up and go speak, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. I didn't think my chest could contain it. And I got calmed down. I said, take some breaths and relax. God, help me calm down. i got to get this under control. I got calmed down, and I got up to the microphone, and that other guy was speaking, and my chest went boom, boom, boom again. And I'm breathing so hard, this guy sitting right here is kind of looking at me. <laughs> He's blowing on me. <laughs> we got through it. So why did they take your clip? They were filming everything. Yeah, the whole thing. No, I, mean, I, I, I just focused that, on that clip, though. I got calmed down by the time I got to that clip. By the time I got started speaking, I was able to get myself down to where I could... I, and I had my notes written down, so I didn't have to worry about trying to think about what I was going to say. But don't worry. Don't worry about anxiety attacks. God, Jesus is going to tell you how to be happy. Anybody like that idea? All right. Well, let's break up into our discussion groups. Turn over to page 138, and we'll have some discussion <coughs> questions. Sylvia? Oh, that's right. <laughs> you can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.